Ottawa grew in an extremely haphazard manner. Um, it was an industrial town. And around 1900, uh, Laurier, th this is, uh, sorry, er, Laurier had mentioned that he wanted Canada to, the 20th century would be Canada's century. Laurier said this at the turn of the century. But here's Earl Grey, um, obviously taking sips of tea in between. <laughs> um, in, in 1911, he's, he's retiring. Ottawa is destined not only to become a great, beautiful federal capital of a country of a hundred million people, <laughs> but it will also become an industrial city of note with 500,000 horsepower within 30 miles of the city and its transportation faci facilities, which will be unrivaled when the Georgian Bay Canal is completed, which never happened. The future of Ottawa seems to be one of certain greatness. The citizens of today must plan to add dignity to the city of the future, which will be the capital of the greatest portion of the British Empire. <laughs> so, we, given that, there were plans afoot to see if they could do something with downtown. And this man, uh, Noel Conchon, Cochon, um, was, this, was essentially the town planner. One of the great regrets I have in Ottawa is that no mayor has ever been a town planner by, cha by training. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. There's a little town called Curitiba in Brazil, and the last seven mayors have been town planners, and they all went to university together and were asked to plan the city for the next 50 years, and then they became mayors in succession. If we had had at least a couple of town planners somewhere along the way. Anyway, it was, so it, it, it was farmed out. And this gentleman um, was asked if he could come up with some various plans, almost none of which were uh, uh, employed, but some of them we, w we will see. But he wanted Ottawa to become a port, a national port. How the heck? <laughs> How, I mean, Montreal's just two hours away. What, what, do you, what are you on about? But one of the things that he picked up was uh, uh, that a gentleman called Todd in 1904, he was, he was a, a Holt Renfrew executive, but he was also asked, and one of the things that he did, and it's the start of the park movement in Ottawa, the park movement. Um, as I think I said to you, I was told by a landscape architect that the reason the city needs parks is that its citizens need somewhere to go and think, right? And so Cochon had parks all over the place, little ones like you see in, in, in London, you know. You're, it's, it's lovely and when you're in London, you're just walking along and, and then there's a little park. Um, so Cochon tried various ideas. Um, um, he also had a line of clothing <laughs> going at the same time. <laughs> um, this is, this is a, a combination of his and Todd's plan that was eventually put out by a, a gentleman called Edward Bennett. And I, there's something I want you to notice here. See that word subway? <laughs> Proposed tunnel. Proposed tunnel. 1914. Proposed tunnel along Wellington. Of course, now it's, it's, it's one road down, two roads down. Um, so by then, uh, London had the Green Line, which was 18... 86 had the had, had the uh, the green line but it's taken us a hundred years plus another five to try and get it right <laughs> and there is the plan that mr. Bennett came up with for downtown Ottawa it's based on the Chicago model which was called the city beautiful the Chicago World's Fair was a display basically of the, the city beautiful. So there's the train station. Um, this, was a, this was to be an apartment block. And as you can see, he's paved over the canal. There's the canal there. He's not, the canal is still working, yeah. but he's paved, he's, he's paved over it. Um, um, and th this would now be which bridge would that be? Uh, Laurier. Laurier, the Laurier Bridge. Yeah, the Laurier, the Laurier Bridge. Um, notice there's no, 
Confusion Square yet. Those are the old Parliament buildings. Um, and then here's the Chateau Laurier. Um, and that's the transportation building. That's the one you're talking about. So I kind of fancy that. Uh, had, they, had, they, ha had they bothered to do it, um, as I say, the Department of Knocking Things Down would have had a great time with this. So the the oh, that's a $2 fine. Do the three lines go under that apartment building? Yes. Yeah. From down the, the, the train lines are here. The, the, they're here. There they are. And then there's the canal. Yeah, yeah. It's a $5 fine if you answer the phone, by the way. <laughs> now, all of this got scuppered. Uh, by a few things, is a, a thing called the First World War, and this is the Parliament burning down in 1916. Um, they think it started in one of the uh, one of the MPs' rooms. Um, the story, hard to prove, is that uh, it was that it was that with a cigar into a waste paper basket, um, but. It was in February, so you can see these guys trying to put the fire out. It was freezing on contact. The water was freezing on contact, so the whole thing ended up covered in ice. Um, this was called the Victoria Tower. We now call it the Peace Tower. Um, the thing completely burned out. The only thing that survived around the back was the Parliamentary Library, which is the most beautiful room in uh, Ottawa. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what year was this 1916. 1916. February 1916. Um, at midnight exactly, the big bell f fell right the way down to the bottom. Crashed. Right at midnight, down it went. Um, and there was a flag, which is, it's, been, it's not there, but the flag was taken down. As soon as the thing started, they took the flag down. It's in the Bytown Museum the flag that from, from the night the Parliament buildings burnt down. And so where is Parliament going to be? It went to the Victoria Memorial Museum. And it was there until 1924 or 5. They held Parliament there while they were building the new Parliament buildings, the ones that we've got now. Little side story here, which I kind of like. That's that's on Guig. Guig was one of the archbishops that we had, the Roman Catholic priest. It's it, at that point. It's now it's a uh, it's a can't afford it apartment. Um, speaking personally, um, and it's it was a school, and th th a a bill was passed called number 17, which said that you could only teach French for one hour per week in a classroom. This is a French school. It's a Roman Catholic French school. It's a boys' school. And the teachers were having none of it, in particular these two, the Deloge sisters, Beatrice and I, I'll get the name of the other one, um, and they refused to follow this. And actually, they started holding classes in nearby buildings and homes <coughs> for the boys. Then they started being smuggled in around the back in order to teach. The police were asked to go down. <laughs> the police were asked to go down, and there was a line of at least a hundred mothers of the boys that were in the school, all with their hat pins out. <laughs> all with their hat pins out. <laughs> oh, this is the lady that lost her phone. That's, that's a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Have you got it? 
Does she have it? One way to do it is to put it in the other room. <laughs> you got a, there's a certain irony about doing a, a three, six hour lecture on Ottawa history and being interrupted by a phone. The, so the sisters, so, so the, Im, imagine the scene outside here. There's, there's a few policemen. There's at least a hundred parents with hat pins. And they're defending and rolling pins. Oh. And they're ready to, they're ready to, <laughs> yes. Th they're not having it. The Bill 17 stood until 1960. They for just forgot to take it off the books. But for the next few years, we're in, we're 1920 now. They just, they just, they, they let the school have it. They just, they gave up. They said, oh, to heck with it. Uh, so it's called the hat pin riot. There's actually a mural devoted to it at the side of, I don't know if it's still there on the Bywood Market, where the giant tiger used to be. There's a little alleyway there. If you go down and look at the end of the alleyway, there's a, there's a mural to the hat pin riot. Yeah. Where is that? It's on Geeg. It's on Geek, yeah, it's on the Bywood Market, oh. on Geek. As you're walking along Dalhousie, Housie, Housie, you can see it. Okay. it. Just look down there. Yes? I'm afraid to say that my great-grandfather was the Minister of Education. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> from the Farmers, from the farmers <laughs> Union <laughs> Party. Uh, from the Farmers <laughs> Union? <laughs> oh, didn't that eventually become the... Um, uh, didn't Tommy Douglas co-opt that to become the uh, the Farmers Party out in the prairies? I think he did, yeah. Um, so there we are, the hat pin riot. The hat pin riot. Once again, the women, we're not taking it. We're not taking it. This is the arrival. Uh, this, uh, this is people listening to the radio, but the actual arrival of the radio, again around in the 1920s, the very first... Canadian broadcast of a hundred miles on the radio was from Montreal to the ballroom of the Chateau Laurier. Ballroom of the Chateau Laurier. And so it's this is the arrival of long distance entertainment. Um, there were songs. Um, a, a, a Scottish gentleman sang um, uh, will you go, lassie, go, and was asked to sing it again. Um, and then there were various speeches. The mayor at the time was Stanley Lewis, who was, uh, until Jim Watson was our longest serving mayor. And uh, he made a little speech. Um, and uh, it's the very first North American long distance radio broadcast that took place in the Chateau Laurier. Does anybody recognize who that is? is it Freeman? It's Lillian Freeman. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. I want to come at the First World War through this woman. She, Lillian Freeman eventually becomes known as the poppy lady. She's the poppy lady. Uh, but she comes from an extremely, she, uh, she's Freeman, she married Freeman. Uh, the department store, yeah, the Freeman's department store. She, uh, she's actually from the Bilski family, which is one of the oldest. She's a daughter of Moses Bilski, who was one of the very first uh, Jewish families to move into the area. Um, but grew up in an extremely th philan philanthropic household and had heard of this business of the poppies in North America, uh, in, in the United States and, in Britain, and imported it into Canada. Um, she died in 1940, and her funeral was covered in poppies. That there are, yeah. But also, and this is interesting given now, she w would make s several trips over to Europe to rescue refugees, Jewish refugees. And she brought a whole bunch over from Ukraine, 150 of them from Ukraine. Um, her, the home that she's in is now the uh, Naval Club. Uh, it's opposite the back 
of the new city hall. On that road there, there's, there's a, you'll see this fancy building. It's, it's the Naval Club. Um, but um, kind of an unsung hero, Lillian Fleem Freeman. Um, how many people had actually heard of her? Oh, okay. Oh, well, the news is spreading. Um, <laughs> But as I say, she died, she died in no 1940. But I think she's one of Ottawa's great phil uh, philanthropists. Yeah. Um, they would, she would gather gangs of women and they would, and that's not the right word. Um, <laughs> troops? Uh, um, troops of, of women and they would, they, would, um, they would make clothing for the soldiers and send them over during the First World War as well. Yeah. And she died just in time to see the beginning of the Second World War, um, which she was sure would never happen. Yeah. So when she brought the Jewish people over, was that the same time that the government was not letting Jewish people in? It's, 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 um, that's, um, that's Borden that passed the, uh, because there was an influx after the Jim Crow laws. Before the turn of the century, there was, a, there was an influx of people as the Jim Law Crow laws came in and after, after slavery had been abolished, into, I've been to uh, an area called the Amber Valley in, uh, in the prairies in Saskatchewan, which one is, was one of the original Negro settlements. But the Jews, you said she brought Jewish people from Europe. Well, you, but uh, she, yes, she did, yeah. Was that not one when the government was turning back? Well, the, the Borden, Borden did say w uh, 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 well, one Jew is, is one too many. Yeah. That's what you're thinking of. It was Borden that, that did it, she yeah. Was able to get them in. She was able to get them in, yeah. Yeah. The, um, that's, I mean, that's following, well, the, the, uh, that's following on from the pogroms, uh, the pogroms around the turn of the, of the century as well. But... Um, We'll see something regarding Charlotte Witten to do with that, which you probably know about. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the war, uh, the First World War, 10,000 Ottawans came down with Spanish flu. Most of them in the poorer homes, then as now. And it was decided by Fisher, Harold Fisher, who was the mayor at the time, that we needed a hospital, in a sense a quarantine hospital, right on the outside of Ottawa. And for that it was actually called Fisher's Folly, but this is the Civic Hospital, built in 1923. There's nothing around it, look. So now, of course, it's, it's, it's what, what we call des res, desirable residences, all the way around it. So, and here's the experimental farm, and then it, uh, this is the uh, nurse's quarters, and it opened up in uh, 1923. Um, and um, I remember going in there. My father got cancer and uh, was in there for a year, so I would go down and visit him in the in the in the old Civic. Um, of course, now there's the expansion planned for the Ottawa Hospital, and they want to put it over here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is Carling. This is Carling. This is Carling. You see, it ends. Yeah. yeah th n that's. I mean, the point of it was that it was way outside Ottawa. That's what you're not turned around. If that's the Actually, this is Carling. Yeah, that's right. yeah. I beg your pardon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's Carling, and that's the experimental farm. That's that beautiful little lane that you can still go down now. Yeah. Sorry, I've got it upside down. Yeah. Sorry. No, not then, not then, not then. Um, so the erection of the, erection of the civil hosp uh, civic hospital. That's our second city hall, uh, built in the 1880s. And it was down where the National Arts Center is now. And there was a police station next to it and uh, the fire department was also next to it. Um, it caught, f here we go again, it caught fire in, in 1931 and uh, burnt down, on plus a lot of the archives were in there. 
So there's this sort of gap um, in, in, the, in the historical record um, because of the, uh, the, a lot of the property records, etc., that were stored in there. Um, so it, picture in your mind now, th so the National Arts Center, um, the old post office, uh, the Russell Hotel, the Ru well, the Russell Hotel has, got, has gone by that point. It, uh, it's been built on. Um, Mackenzie King is in the process. He's prime minister, and he's in the process of wishing that Ottawa become the Washington of the North. Not London, the Washington of the North. So he wants that area. Now that this is burnt, it's a lucky stroke. I think Mackenzie King might have even started the fire. <laughs> the, th that he wants that area to put in uh, Confederation Square. He wants to put a square in there. He's busy, as he says, making it the Washington of the North. One of his schemes was to have a, uh, a huge monument, war monument the size of Vimy on one of the Gatineau Hills that could be <laughs> visible from Ottawa. But he wants to redesign downtown Ottawa, which is a bit of a mess. So he brings over a gentleman in 1939, just unfortunately, again, war gets in the way. He brings over a gentleman called Jacques Rebert, who's a French town planner, to have a look. And we'll see later on. Uh, Rebert, th that had to be scrapped. Um, Mackenzie King goes on uh, to become uh, our longest serving prime minister in, 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 in gulps. Um, the inside of Mackenzie King's head is a strange and wonderful place, <laughs> but uh, it's a different country. But, um, but uh, his plans for Confederation Square, at this point, he's really pushing them hard. He's really pushing them hard. What else gets in the way? The Depression. This is a work make work party in Rockcliffe Park, in Rockcliffe Park. The depression hit its height in, in 1933, which was also the coldest winter up until that point on record in Ottawa. It hit minus 38 uh, centigrade. Um, so you can see these gentlemen are, uh, A, they're underdressed, um, and whoever's selling berets that year is doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> but they're working on ro they're working on what is now uh, I think one of the most beautiful parks in Ottawa, which is Rockcliffe Park, um, and that th it's a make work program. Ottawa set up a a, a, a welfare welfare bureau, uh, and a woman called Toiz uh, was put in charge of it, and she was uh, she <laughs> she she the city let her go after a year because she was uh, quote. She was being too soft. She was handing out too much money to uh, the welfare groups. At one point, there were 500 people on the welfare rolls in Ottawa during the Great Depression. Um. Put Ottawa on the map worldwide. I think, definitely in the world of photography. <laughs> now this is the start of some <laughs> something wicked this way comes. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it, there is a small one. This is 1958. There is actually a small one. But it's the, uh, this is the opening of Ottawa's first real uh, Mall uh, out, out at Westgate, still there. It's been renovated a few times. Did you miss an episode? Then go to rogerstv.com and watch The History of Ottawa According to Phil Jenkins online anytime. Thanks for watching.